bullshit video. Bullshit video. That's the perfect title right there. So, how do we get on that? The music? Yeah, I listen to that synthesizer. I, for every now and again, I'll get a kick. I'll listen to that for a couple months. You know, if it's just there, I'll turn it on and off. Oh, the one that you showed me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems kind of funny, but I like it. It's good background. You should make some videos about that, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I kind of wanted to sell one of those. I mean, I should have brought the other one over that looks cool. It's all laser cut acrylic. Ooh, I'd love to get into that. Yeah, I got a laser cutter if you ever want to cut anything. Mm. I always wanted to just make a new case for the front loader motherboard. Oh, yeah? You know? Like and what? Just a, of clear acrylic, mm. just to make it look cool, you know? So you could, you know, probably have a game up front too, but uh -huh. you could take that out, then you could see all the components. The guts. Yeah. Put bling, bling EDs, I mean LEDs in there. <laughs> yeah, the music controlled thumping LEDs, that'd yeah. be awesome. Of yeah, course, yeah. when they switch to turn it off. And yeah, everybody loves on. LEDs mm -hmm. in things that light, they, people like things that light up. Yeah, which in a clear cut case, it looks really nice. Mm -hmm. It's not like in your face. Yeah, you know? yeah, because it lights the guts up. Yeah, it just kind of... All blingifies yeah. it. Yeah, I got um, the laser cutter, so I haven't really done a lot with it. It's at work, but you know, I can use it. So I was using my circuit board program to cut, to make the lines to cut. That's how, really? yeah, that's how I was doing it. Mm -hmm. mm. See, I tried to learn uh, SolidWorks. Oh yeah, oh god, that's... Oh my god, dude. Mm. Well, and I was just going through their help uh -huh. and how to learn it, and it wasn't matching up. Oh yeah, like, I probably exactly a different what it version, <laughs> probably a different version, yeah. I was like, that's fuck. always a problem. <laughs> Yeah, well, see, the laser cutter it cuts sheets of acrylic, basically, so you build things up, you know, out of flat pieces. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. So right. the synthesizer I did, actually, if you want to see what it looks like, I got pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is my stuff I can't be asked to make a web page about, but, you know, if people want to see what it looks like. So this is layers of it. So these are the various parts that I cut out. Right. And then and is this one sheet of acrylic or just? Oh, these are just the different parts. I cut them out of. I actually I did. I cut the acrylic into pieces, and then I cut these out of those one pieces. Time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could have been all one sheet. So then the. So then there's like the. There's some of this. I have an LCD, a um, uh, FPGA, microcontroller, RAM chip, and you know, a DAC. It's weird to see an FPGA on a PCB without any solder mask. Mm hmm. So there's the case. Cool. So it's. Uh, oh, that would definitely sell, dude. Mm hmm. So that's uh, like 11 pieces, and that's a capacitive touch, so there's no buttons. There's, there's, so the, you just got, this is a thin piece of acrylic with the holes in it, and then your finger touches the acrylic and there's a circuit board, that circuit board's there, and you can see this pattern. So this is like an analog slider, and then these are just buttons. Hmm. So that's how it works. And this was playing SPCs on this one, you know, Ninten uh, Super Nintendo stuff. So then there's like the, what it looks like. Cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I took a couple days to design it, and you know, about yeah, five or ten minutes to cut it out. So it's like, and then you know, the the laser cutter doesn't cut a straight line through the plastic; it's got a draw on it. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the, you can see the draw here. So I like line the pieces up. So the ones on the top, the draw goes up, and the ones on the bottom go down. So it's so it's all nice and even, right. you know. Otherwise, it would look kind of funny, look like a pyramid, you know, if you... Right. So, because each piece is a slightly different size to compensate. So, I think it worked out pretty well. And it's just held together with six screws, and there's a there's a, a standoff through the holes, the threaded standoff, and then the screws just hold it all together. That's it. It's real simple. And the circuit board just sits, sits in there. It's kind of hard to see, but um, one of the layers had to be, like, really thin, 
yeah, this layer is really thin because the circuit board sits in there. Yeah, see, these ones are pretty thick, but this one had to be super thin because of that. Right. And then there was some O-rings on the standoffs, and then so when the next layer goes on, that pushes the circuit board against the layer underneath it, locking the board in place so it cannot, you know, move. It can't wiggle. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how it worked. And then this is a battery cavity. So I don't have the battery, but that's what that's for, for a lithium-ion battery. And then, you know, that's pretty much it. So, yeah, I should have brought that over. So, and it's got four RGB LEDs, and they flash when the music plays. <laughs> so, that was an early, early demo. And then the final looked like Looks like that. You know, there's where I was loading. And then, so yeah, that's what it looks like. So song name, um, how long it's got left to play, current track, total tracks, you know, artist and what it's from. Super cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have my uh, screen capture program oh, yeah. running while you're doing that. Well, well, if you want to do it, you know, you just poke. You know, I can give you the URLs. And you can just poke through there. That's just you know, just yeah. open for anybody to poke in there, really. Yeah. So the backlight's got an RGB backlight on that LCD too. Really? So, yeah, I have a bunch of options where you can change the color, make it fade. You know, like slowly change color. You know, like do a gradient and stuff like that. Because that was my first really big C project. That's all written in C, so that was kind of a that was kind of a good big step. Because everything else up to this point pretty much has been you know if it's a big project, usually been in a SEM. So this is the first time I've gone to C for stuff like. So I've been using it a lot since then. It's awesome, but so this was a good stepping stone to that, I guess you could say. Right. Yes, I got basically every 8-bit CPU is on the on my FPGA now, so. I'm pretty good when it comes to CPU age. So for that work project, I used the Z80 for the Master System and Game Gear. It got reused at work, and I licensed it to work. So that was cool. Hmm. So I haven't actually built and sold the system, but I've been selling. You know, I've been licensing the pieces, so at least it gets some use. So yeah. Yeah, when you come over, we'll you know, maybe go through some of the systems I run, you know, explain it better maybe on camera. Definitely. So, let can see how, I can show how, how, it, how it works, how you load it, what it looks like, and all that stuff. Functionality-wise, because, you know, right now I just got the videos, which is good, but, I mean, like I said, there's no commentary or anything. Cause I really don't have any video processing software to do it yet, so... The list of videos to make is getting longer and longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all the new stuff and then the old stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the synthesizer, that was last year, so that was about a year and a half ago now. 214 last year. So that has MIDI on it too, but the MIDI isn't hooked up really, so it's there but I never finished programming it. So the idea was is you'd be able to load in a a software synthesizer into this and like play it with a keyboard or from a PC. You know, send it MIDI data and you can play music through it. That was the idea. I just didn't get it that far. It plays uh, SPCs though, which is the Super Nintendo audio, so that's pretty big. Oh yeah, the FPGA does that too. There's a SPC player built in too. So there's like 17 systems, SPC player and Mandelbrot zoomer in real time. What's that? You don't know what Mandelbrot is? It's like a fractal. It's really cool looking. But, and you can use a Nintendo controller and zoom and pan and all that. Mm. Looks really cool. I'd like to check that out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> What is that box right there? With all the wires coming out of it? Yeah. Just a uh, keyboard monitor switcher. Oh, okay. KV, the, is it KVM KVMs, switcher? yeah, I had a KVM up, up until about a year ago. Well, because I used to have a 1.4, 
right next to that. Uh huh. And for whatever reason, I just never would switch over to the 2.8. Oh yeah. I had that. I don't know how long I had that. 1.4. I oh, probably only got rid of it like just a couple years ago. Well, that's what I did. You know, my last computer, I kept them both running. You know, and it's cause it is, it's really hard to switch to a new computer. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I do remember. It was actually the software that that uh, captures what you're doing on the screen. I can't remember what I use. Uh huh. Bandy can. <laughs> Bandy Cam was what I was trying, and uh -huh. I, do, I do have like one or two videos where I used it. Uh huh. And it's just overlaying that screen on top of what you're whatever talking video. about. Uh huh. And that it just ruined the 1.4. You know what I mean? It just <laughs> yeah. Not do yeah. anything else because it was such a memory hog or whatever. And so I finally upgraded to the 2.8, and it, was, <laughs> it just barely runs on there. Uh huh. Yeah, I just upgraded um, last January. I had a, uh, I have had a quad core something or another for like six years, and I finally upgraded. So I don't know what I have now. Well, the only reason I got one in there uh, <coughs> was because I, I did have just a laptop hooked up in there. Uh huh. But in there is where I do all my video editing. Oh, okay. So I was like, it's probably time to get something a little more powerful than my shit. What is that thing? 2.4, I think, uh -huh. dual core uh -huh. laptop. <laughs> you know, with you know, no video, anything going on, memory or otherwise, and I finally upgraded to that thing just so I could do it, and edit a video, uh -huh. and not worry about it being messed up after it was done rendering. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, a lot of the videos I was doing it initially two years ago, I, after I uploaded them to. YouTube and you'd watch and you'd somebody know and somebody you give a comment like yeah this video's fucked up I'm like, God damn it not again <laughs> <laughs> yeah this happened to me like uh, maybe a couple more videos before the last one that we did. oh really yeah and just for no reason the video went to a green screen and the audio was fine huh I don't and, remember that I think well I, I, it was only up for like ten minutes oh well before somebody why. commented and said oh, okay. oh your video's messed up <laughs> oh that would be why yeah but it just seems to be no for no apparent reason. It's not like I'm is stressing the, the computer while the I was trying to render. Is it the video itself or was it a YouTube problem? The video itself. Because oh, okay. I checked, you checked it again. the rendered mm -hmm. file and it was bad. Well, that sucks. Yeah. So I had to re-render it and re-upload it and just no apparent reason why hmm. it was messed up to begin with. Yeah, that's just one hell of a KVM. My KVM was like a little baby thing. <laughs> well, and it's supposed to be powered too, mm. like a powered USB host. Oh, kind of okay. Thing. Yeah, because see, mine was just one of those little ones about this big, which is sure. two ports on it. Yeah, and that's a four. And, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I used to. I think I used to use the two point eight to burn DVDs. Uh huh. Of course. When that was going on, I didn't want to do anything with uh -huh. it, so I would just switch back to the 1.4 and continue working on whatever I was doing. Old school technology right there. <laughs> well, I'm still using that Pentium 166 at work. Man, I bought, I got that thing, and it was a Pentium 75, and we bought it brand new in 95. And then in like 96 or something, my friend gave me a Pentium 166 chip. And dropped it in there and still using it. 75 is what I started with. A Pentium 75? Yeah. I think it had a... I'm trying to remember now. Probably 8 yeah. or 16 megs of RAM. I want to say it was only 8. I think mine, mine, you know, the case that says on the back, the specs, I think it is 8. Mine was 8 or 16 when I got it. Well, it, uh, in 95, I went to Rose Holman, and, okay. and they required everybody to have a laptop. Oh, yeah? And, of course, they had some for sale, so pretty much everybody just got theirs and mm -hmm. whatever. And you could either have a 75 megahertz or a 100 megahertz. Of course, I had the 75, and my roommate had a 100. Uh-huh. 
Well, you could play Quake on it. And I want to say the, oh god, what was the hard drive? It was so tiny. Probably on uh, at that time about a 500 meg hard drive would probably be about right. Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> and a laptop maybe smaller than that. Yeah. 250 to 350 maybe. I, that that sounds high. But nah, I remember be, I was. It'd be at least that big. At I that was time. Uh, constantly defragging and doing anything I could to get more memory because <laughs> that was also my first. Uh, Real four way to have four way into having internet by myself. Okay. So of course yeah, I was looking to download the P all word. Day. <laughs> That's all I did. <laughs> that was man. I probably boy your arms were tired. I probably would have <laughs> made it all four years if I had been more focused and not not had the not that looking for it all the time. <laughs> not having the internet. I like. missed work one day because. I was on a laptop, probably downloading port, I don't know. Probably more playing a game because that was the first time you could actually play like network, the internet, like yeah, Doom uh -huh. or mm -hmm. Doom Nukem or whatever, you know. Yep. It was pretty awesome. Oh, sorry, work over me and I have a fapping related oh, they called, injury. Yeah, they called me. <laughs> oh, they did. And I was positive I didn't have to work. <laughs> I felt so bad. Yeah, I felt real bad about it, I'm sure. <laughs> I haven't missed a day of work this whole year. Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I well, I visited my parents out in Arizona um, in the spring, but other than that, I just haven't missed a day of work. Well, well. Because you only work four or five hours a day? Yeah, but I go in every day. <laughs> not every day. Well, you know, every day at work. <laughs> you know, every work day. Obviously, I don't go in on, on holidays, you know. We no. don't get any of the bullshit holidays off. You know, like the, when the banks are closed. Yeah. The government holidays. The government holidays. It's like Columbus Day. You know. Those are bullshit holidays. Mm-hmm. It's not a holiday unless everybody gets it off. You don't work weekends, though, do you? No. Nope, fortunately, my time is my own, so... I think this weekend is going to be the last really good weekend of the year. It's supposed to hit 80 degrees and... It's really cold. Yeah, it was crazy cold. Yeah, I was freezing. I've already got the space heater out. Yeah, I saw that. I got one of those at work. I don't want to turn the furnace on. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Shit, if I can sit here, as long as, as long as it stays in the low 60s, uh -huh. and I got a space heater, I'll be okay, but this house has no insulation. So once it's like 50 or lower outside, the furnace has got to come yeah. on. Yeah, I bet last, last, this last winter it probably really sucked. It sucks every winter. Yeah. It was so cold last winter, you know, <clears> that <throat> last winter. I was trying to get a, a new furnace put in and get central air because I hate having window air conditioning. Trying to get a heat pump. Yeah, I've been looking at That's it. That's what I got. And I had to replace the fucking thing uh, three years ago. That sucked. Right. That's like seven thousand bucks. Oh my! How much it cost? It's like six thousand seven hundred or something. But my God! I mean, yeah, I was reading up. You know, there's um, the two most thing, most expensive things that you can have to have repaired in your house. Roof is number one. HVAC's number two. And I need both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I keep thinking I'm just gonna buy a bulldozer. <laughs> Fuck it. Just. Because every system of this house needs attention. Needs work. Mm -hmm. Roof, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, windows, termite damage. Mm -hmm. I didn't know we had termites in Indiana. <laughs> Tell us how much I yeah, know. fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I've, and I own another house in Morristown uh -huh. that I rent out, and it had termite damage. Or it had termites uh -huh. when I bought it. And, of course, I was... 24 when I bought that house, uh -huh. so I had no clue. And they put out the bait stations, uh -huh. right? I thought that was going to get rid of them. That's no, how that's dumb just, I was. Well, that just tells you if they're there or not. Exactly. And the real estate lady that sold to me was also the daughter-in-law of the owners. Okay. So she was supposed to take care of everything. Uh huh. She fucking didn't. She screwed me. There was like a fuel tank buried on the back side of the house. Oh. And the inspector said, oh, that's got to come out. Uh huh. She calls me one day and says, I can't find this fuel tank that he's talking about. And of course me, I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. Fuck. 
Did you have to get it taken out? Well, no. <laughs> but if I ever sold it... Oh, you would have to. I would have to do something. Which means I'm going to go back there, dig down about a foot, cut it off, <laughs> and, cover and back rebury up. it. Yeah. it. There ain't nothing in it. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's just an old fuel tank. Who cares? It's not ever going to go anywhere. Oh, no, the tree huggers. Oh, we got to get that out of there. So, yeah. I yeah, my, kinds of housework he's done. Yeah, my house is uh, was built in 2001, so at least I don't have those kinds of problems yet. Right. I want to get out of there pretty soon, though. I want to move. Why? Because the neighborhood's going to pot. Oh. You said Lawrence? Yeah. Like, how far north and east? Um, Oak Landon. Oh. So, right there. That's not bad. It it's is, a lot worse. It's getting bad now. Huh. Yeah, it's kind of shitty. Well, here's what happened. When I moved in, I moved in in 2007. So I've been there seven years now. I moved in in about August, I think it was, in 2007. And it was it was great. And then everybody kind of lost their house, you know. Right. Foreclosed on. Yeah. And so what happened, all these shitty out-of-state companies bought the houses. Now they rent them out to uh, welfare people. So, you know... It really pisses me off because, you know, the rent in the house is about $1,100 and the mortgage on th that type of house is about $650. <laughs> so, you know, they're soaking the government for one. And then so these, these people that don't work and have too many kids and all that, they get like catered lawn service once a week. You know, someone comes out and mows the lawn for them and trims the trees and the shrubs and all that. And here I got to do that myself. You know, these dorts don't work. I'm sure a lot of them can work. I mean, I can't say that about everybody, but, you know, yeah. it just annoys me greatly to see these people just, you know, I go to work and they just, like, sit outside drinking beer, smoking cigarettes all day, don't do anything. You know, what can you do? So, and, uh, you know, the... Since it's all rentals now, no one really cares about what their house looks like because it's hey, it's not their house. Exactly. So they don't care. Exactly. So you know, like the neighbor's house has like trees growing out of the foundation of the house because hey, they don't care. It's right. not their house, so yeah, it's gonna crack. And the landlords don't live around here, so they don't. Then they keep don't up know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just that's like the last two or two or three years. So I want to sell that place, get a place that's about twice as expensive, so I can yeah, you know, so. The government's not going to pay that much money, hopefully, to, you know, rent out a house for someone. <laughs> so. I lucked out with my renter. Oh, I hope he stays forever. Older single guy. Mm -hmm. No pets. Man. Mm -hmm. And he awesome. actually wants to work on the house. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah. He's like, hey, can I pull the carpet out of the bathroom? Well, fuck yeah, you can. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> he, like, wants to epoxy the garage floor and uh -huh. everything. I'm like, yeah. I was like, dude, I knew you were my guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're well, that's a great kind of runner. Oh well, see, he was commuting from Connorsville to Indianapolis. Okay. And of course, he was looking for a house just outside of 465, and it had to have a garage. And he said, "I could not find anything under a thousand dollars a month that had a garage and was outside of the loop." Okay. And until, I, of course, until I posted mine, and I'm sure it's still a little further than he wanted to commute, but price was right, huh? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you want to see um, when the neighbors next to me, they were they rented this house for about eight years. You know, it's like a $100,000 house, and they rented it for eight years. For the money they spent on rent, they probably could have just about owned this place. Right. And when they, and they trashed the house. I mean, they fucked it up. You know, here's some... I'm trying to find the pictures. It's in this directory somewhere. You got a lot of unnamed pictures there, buddy. Yeah, I know, I do. And that suck. Oh, you want to see what the, my... I can show you this real fast. Oh, where is it? I think it's this one. 60, oh, yeah, that's the, that's the FPGA system right there. That's what it looks like. Uh, there, there's uh, that DVI slash HDMI output from it. You can mm. see the pixels. <laughs> Beautiful. So, yeah. Mm. Um, because these last ones, oh yeah, that's those, those are like the spiders I get, big hairy spiders. Um, whoops. I 
thought it was called Neighbors from Hell, but I don't think it is. Nope. Nope. Oh, there it is. What a glorious sight. They pulled in one of those dumpsters, those construction dumpsters. To go out of the bed carpet and everything else and re remodel it? Yeah, but I have a picture in here somewhere. I'm not sure where though. I thought it was right by that. About um, what it looked like after they um, pulled everything out. And that dumpster was twice as full as, you know, what it should have been. I mean, they trashed the house so bad that they threw away the doors from all the rooms. That's how bad it was. Right. And I was laying in bed on, like, Saturday, and I heard someone using my faucet outside. And it was the painters painting that house. I pissed off. I called them up. I was like, hey, you, you know, why are you using my faucet without asking? If you ask me, I'd let you use it. And the you know, guy's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but you know, just ask me next time. So then I asked him how bad it was over there. <laughs> he said it was really bad. Because they had three dogs, they had cats, they had kids. There was like seven adults living in this two or, two or three room house. And then kids, and dogs, and you name it. And dogs you know, the, are the worst. The dogs pissed and shat everywhere. You know, like, I was out sitting on my back um, deck, and the kid was, like, jumping through the bedroom window. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, oh, God, it was a mess. And, you know, it's just insane. So it took them, like, a month to clean that place up. It was so bad. You know, it was like Hoarders. And, you know, the TV show. Yeah. I love that show. Really? I God, I love that show so I've much. I've seen like three episodes and I was so disgusted I never watched it again. It was like a train wreck. I just had to watch it. <laughs> I was so disappointed when they canceled that. Oh, I didn't know they did. Yeah. It ran for five or six years or four or five years. Anyways, yeah, I don't know. I had the picture, but I don't know what happened to it, unfortunately. But that was the... Yeah, see, it's all just, you know, if I want to show someone something, I just throw it in here and link to it. So that's why everything is just totally unsorted. Yeah, feel free to poke through here, that's what it's for. In any event, it was maybe it was these. No, nope. some chips. Nope, schematic. It's before that. Nope, there's schematic. How about that? Mm. Oh well. In any event, let me just try a few more. Oh, there's my. I do like that. The game gear on the monitor. That's pretty cool. Isn't that funny? That's on that's on my um like your monitor there, the Sony Trinitron. And that's the SPC player. So it looks like there's text up there and stuff, but this is like the memory, so you can actually when the when it's playing, you can actually see the memory doing its thing. Cool. Yeah, I don't have pictures of that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a weird looking one. Yeah, isn't that cool? So that's why I'm saying that PPU is just like that, where the die is attached to this part and then the lid goes on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why the heat sink was on the sides like that. Uh, yeah. I don't know what happened to it. But anyways, they filled that dumpster all the way to the top, and it was twice as high as the dumpster was high. I mean, it was like, it was like seven or eight feet of shit that they had taken out of there. You know, they had to take out all the carpet, and they left, like, all sorts of stuff. Furniture, you name it. It was all piss-soaked. 
Right. So, those right. are the kind of renders you don't want. No. No, not kind of hit them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they punched holes in all the walls. You know, the walls had holes in them. The doors were had holes in them. If they were still on the hinges. Awesome. So yeah, that's the kind of renters that live around me now. It sucks. Like the people next to me, their dog shits on my lawn. That really pisses me off. You know, I don't have a dog because I don't want the dog to shit all over my lawn or in the house or you know, you name okay. it. I think dogs are okay when they're not mine <laughs> unless they're shitting in my yard, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just not a pet person, I guess. I mean, I just don't want to deal with the, with the hair and you know the puke smell. and the smell and then you know the dog you got to let them go out and piss and poop all the time. You got to walk them and take them to the vet. And, I don't know. It's just not for me. A lot of people like pets, but hmm, it's kind of a hmm. I just really don't want the hair everywhere. I think I'd rather have a human baby yeah. than a dog. At least they don't shed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and after a couple and, of and if they do smell, it's not like their as fault. Bad. Yeah. I, don't know, I can stand baby poop more than I can stand dog shit. <laughs> well, the good news about a baby is after about three or four years, it stops pooping all over itself. Right. Or, you know, even after a year or two, you know, you right. get them potty trained and Hopefully. then. It's, <laughs> yeah, and then it's a lot better after that. <laughs> yeah, I really, I like living near work, you know, come about 15 minutes away from work, so that's awesome. So I don't have a really big commute. Well, that's why I have that Morristown house, because I work there. Oh, yeah. And I was exactly like 1.2 miles from work. Oh, that's awesome. I, I mean, I could go home for lunch, even if I only had a 20 minute lunch. Uh huh. Oh, so, yeah, I loved it. But, it, I mean, I was only commuting from the north side of Shelbyville to the north side, which is only like 12 miles. Uh huh. And it was still just a dread that 12 miles, you know, there back every single day. I hated it so bad that yeah. I bought a house there. Yeah, I don't like my drive either. I mean, it's like 15 minutes, and it's okay. It's not long, but. It's just a pain in the ass. I, I call this one part of the drive the mile of pain. So it's like I have to make a left turn, you know, not, you know, when I'm going home. It takes like five minutes just to get through this one light. You know, it's like almost a third, it's over a third of the trip, just sitting in a stupid left turn lane. <laughs> it's about a mile long from where, you know, the traffic starts to the end, because then it goes around a curve and it goes up a really steep hill, and there's like businesses, like, you know, there's like stores on both sides, so you know, you've got people trying to get in, and go out. Oh god, it's a mess. That's why it's called the mile of pain. Talking about Fall Creek Road? Fall Creek and um, 79. Oh, yeah. Slash 82nd. Yep. You know it? Yep. Luckily I don't travel as much. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of hard here, like 30 some miles no, away. My buddy's dad lives... It would be... What is it? Sun? Something about Sun. Sunnyside? Sunnyside Road. You go up and it curves back east and, and tees into um, Oaklandon. Oaklandon. Uh huh. Yeah. And you go back north towards the lake a little bit. And okay. There's like two subdivisions. That's where my parents live. There's two huge ones there, right? Yes, yeah, so He parents, lives on the north one. That's where my parents live. Yeah, he lives up in there. That's so. where I used to live when I lived with my parents. Yeah, there's a school near there, elementary school. Yeah. Yeah, I, um,. I live just down the road from my parents, obviously. I'm off of, right off of Oakland in there, so. Not in a subdivision? Yeah, in a subdivision. Oh, okay. I'll say it. There's not very many houses out of a subdivision. The ones that are not in a subdivision are, are badass, though. I was yeah. like, wow. I'm like, what a shitty place to have a kick ass house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you got the, I call it uh, Toke Landon for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is this subdivision called Seven Oaks that I drive by, and they had that the sign. They had like oak trees, but they looked like blunts. Really? So I call it Seven Toaks because <laughs> they look like rolled up, you know, like blunts. Yeah. Yeah, they were white and they were shaped kind of like that. Nice. So yeah, I've been working where I've been working up for. 
this is 23 years now, if you can believe I that. I saying that. Yep. That's fucked up. Mm -hmm. I worked at the factory for 12 and a half years, or 12 years, almost exactly 12 years, but I didn't do the same thing the whole time. I was oh, uh-huh. I started as a press operator, and then I was a team leader, and then I got into maintenance. Uh-huh. Which was a perfect fit for me, but it was so boring. Second shift, nobody was pressing me to do you know, go get the degree and oh, you know, uh -huh. better yourself, you know, because, you know, within the first year, I was already at or above the level of everybody that already had been there for uh -huh. ever. Uh -huh. you know, it didn't take me long to pick it up. So there was no reason for me to do even more, you know, because they contracted out all the hard stuff like PLC programming. Uh huh. They had a, they had a company come. Oh in really? So we didn't oh, even do funny. that. I wanted to, you know. No, but that it's just sucks. Like, yeah, it's not that hard. No, I, and I would have really enjoyed it because it's again. It's it, fun. It's one it, of those hands-on things. Well, and it's a merger of electronics and programming. You know. Yeah. I really love that. But. Why don't you get into microcontrollers? I I want to. I know you bought a book from Fry's, uh, but it was basic stamp. Oh, <laughs> not the basic stamp. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> At least go well, with it. It was one of those learner kits, you know, it came yeah, with everything. Yeah, you know. uh -huh. I was like, well, that's probably a good start. Yeah, probably wouldn't be too bad to start. Well, and I was traveling a lot for the, okay. the last job that I had. So I'd be, you know, holed up in hotels for weeks not mm -hmm. doing anything. I was like, I could per totally bust that out. And it just, I just never finished it. Mm -hmm. It's probably still sitting up there somewhere. <laughs> it's actually probably in that box, but... Yeah, that's it right there. Oh yeah? Yeah. Oh yeah, sure enough. It's like $142 reduced price. Could pass it up. Oh, that's a basic stamp too. So I didn't get very far with that. The bad thing about the basic stamp was if you built something and you wanted to build another, it was so damned expensive. Because that thing's like 50 bucks. That was and a then, bad thing. Oh yeah, Parallax. Mm -hmm. owned it. And they've got a whole other line of stuff, right? Yeah, that poop propeller. Propeller, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't terribly impressed with the propeller, to be honest. I mean, it was kind of an interesting idea, but it was just so limited. You, know, you had eight cores, but you only had like 512 bytes of memory per core, you know, for the program. And it had like 32K of shared memory. So, I mean, it just kind of... I wasn't impressed. If you want to do that, you just go to an FPGA, then you're not limited. You know what an FPGA was kind of cool about it is it's kind of like having an, a lot of little, like, cores. Because, you know, each chip is its own little, like, look on a NES board, you know, your PPU, that's kind of like a little microcontroller type deal. You know, it has a set of instructions it goes through to render the screen. And then your CPU is another one. So... And it all does it in parallel. You know, that's kind of the thing. If you want to do FPGAs, a lot of people have trouble wrapping their head around it, especially if they've programmed before. It's how an FPGA, everything happens at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's all this hardware, so, every, you know, all those registers are all there, and they all can be doing stuff all at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's really not that hard. You just got to wrap your head around it. It's kind of a mind fuck. I mean, granted, it's a big leap going from mapper to CPU, for example, but it's really not that hard. So, yeah, if you want to learn, probably the, uh, the Arduino is probably pretty decent and cheap, more importantly. Down there is a, oh, the Texas Instruments. They were giving those out for free. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, the launch pad? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard of that. I picked one up just because it was free. Yeah, I think I have one of those at work. Never opened up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? I don't think I opened mine up either. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say I got it through Mauser. Uh-huh. You know, free, and I already had an order in anyway. But, oh, I think Dave was talking about it. That's how I found mm -hmm. out about it. Well, see, you know, it works since, you know, we do electronics. We've got all these reps that come in, you know, industry representatives. You know, so there's like a TI rep, you know, national semiconductor, whatever they call it, on semiconductor rep. You know, we have all these reps that come in, and then we got reps from, like, Future and Aero. Those are the big parts distributors. So, you know, we have people come in 
so that's pretty good. You know, they, they give out samples, like they give out stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we give them, you know, they talk with us for a half hour, an hour, or whatever, and give me samples. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome. You know, like I needed FPGAs for that, you know, that six layer board. You know, I was going to buy them out of DigiKey, and then they went non stock. And you had to order like sixty, and I'm not gonna buy like thirty five hundred dollars worth of FPGAs. So I need three or however many. So I talked to the rep, and he got me three samples. Sweet. Yeah, like they're like sixty dollar, fifty dollar FPGAs, and he gave me three of them. So I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really worried about soldering that though. So God, I hope my reflow oven works. Well, if you're getting a stencil. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you're getting mm -hmm. stencil for? Yeah, I already have that. I have the stencil for that. I didn't bring it. I didn't want to bend it up last time I was here. No. I mean, I, I've always wanted to do that. Definitely should uh, well, you can, make a video of that. Yeah. If you want to reflow with my finger, you can. So, you just got to get a board to reflow. So, you, where do you say you use Eagle? Yeah. And that's not actually what I learned with. I think it was, I don't remember the name of the program, but I'm pretty sure it was Sunstone. Had their own free uh, online crap. Oh, yeah. I think I know what that thing is. It's so easy. Yeah. But I couldn't figure out how, and I think I, at that time I was still trying to design uh, Batari's AV mod. Okay. And the pricing, which it automatically showed you the price of what yeah, you were, were trying to design. Yeah. yeah. And it was stupid expensive. So I was like, there's surely there's a better way. And that's when I started researching. Mm -hmm. And then and at that time it was still Dorkbot and I found them and got an order in through them. That's how I started. <clears throat> yeah, Altium is so awesome for a board software though. Man, that thing is awesome. I'm sure it is. <laughs> it was just too intim intimidating for me. Well, the thing about it is, whoever wrote that software uses it. And that's hard to find, you know, in software like that. Whoever writes that software uses it. So everything is all really finely tweaked for making boards fast. Right. You know, Eagle, I have Eagle at work. Whoever wrote Eagle doesn't use it. It's just, ugh. ugh. I think there's been a new update lately. Yeah, I think there has. Which I'm sure it's not, you know, it's still, it's still Eagle. <laughs> well, the thing that really annoyed me about Eagle was it's like they gave up on the user interface. They got so far, and then if you want to do anything that's slightly complicated, you got to type it in on that command line. Have you ever had to do that? Not yet. Oh, yeah, well, I was making a schematic that went on multiple pages, so I had like a 7400 quad NAND or whatever, and I wanted some of the gates on one page and some of the gates on the other, because there's four gates in the chip. Well, to do that, you have to type control alt open chicken, you know, whatever, and into that command line, and then it'll work. Hmm. But, you know, you have to, like, look it up, and, yeah, yeah, I'm going to remember how to do that tomorrow. Yeah, how often do you have to do that? Right. So that was just stuff like that. It really. Oh, and the other thing that really annoyed me, there may be a way to fix it, but I couldn't figure it out. I designed a symbol, hooked all the pins up. Have you ever have designed a symbol, oh, Eagle? Yeah. And you hook all the pins up, and then I forgot, like, one pin. You can't just add the pin. <laughs> it won't let you add the pin. You have to unhook everything. Then you can add the pin and then rehook it all up. Yeah. So I blew like 20 minutes of work. Yeah. God, that sucked. <laughs> Who came up with that? And even just doing that was, it took me a while to get to that point. Making symbols and oh, hooking yeah? it up to a package. Oh my God. In Altium, it's super simple. Really? It's very simple. You make the footprint. And there's footprint generators, so um, I like that for like the dip outline. You know, you saw you saw all those chips on that board. I use the the automatic package maker for those, and it'll make dips, small outline, you know, surface mount, quad flat packs. It makes all of those BGAs even. And then. Should I type in the spacing and stuff, or? 
Yeah, yeah, you, you enter all the parameters like off the data sheet. So you get the chip data sheet and it yeah. says, well, you know, these are all the numbers. It's all standardized, so you put all these numbers in and you get a footprint. Sweet. And then hooking it up is very easy. You design your schematic symbol and then you just go add, um, add a footprint and then you select that footprint. That's it. That's it. That's it. Don't have to connect them. Don't have to connect them. It auto connects. Wow. So yeah. And then there's also the vault. Um, you know, since I actually paid for all Tim or worked it, you know, I'm using my work license because that's legal according to their documentation. You can um, use the engineer can use a copy at home. Is what it says in the in the um, licensing. So that's me. So that's what I'm doing. But um, you can use the Altium Vault, and then they have uh, so many footprints, and they're like the FPGAs are in there, so I didn't have to like type all that in. Um, microcontrollers are in there, you know, connectors, a lot of that stuff's in there. So I didn't even have to make some of those. Yeah, we talked about this last time because that's what mm -hmm. shied me away from KiCad. Oh yeah. Oh god. There I... was zero library at that time. Uh huh. Yeah, KiCad. Mm, I hope no one crucifies me for saying I don't like it, but I mean the only thing it going for it is it's open source. Well yeah. And you know, Altium is your high level stuff and KiCad is your beginner level yeah. stuff. So Well the problem with KiCad that I've I've heard lots of horror stories about it munching your design. Hmm. That's the thing, that's the problem I've heard with it. Hmm. Is, you know, they make a change like someone is telling me um, well, KiCad stores its libraries in the Git repository, apparently. So someone designed a board with the libraries, and then a couple days later, their footprints were all fucked because somebody changed the libraries on the Git repository. Nice. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that horrible? That's, so yeah. I don't know, after I've used Altium, everything else is crap. I'm about the only thing better than Altium would be uh, ORCAD, which is, you know, like motherboards manufacturers probably use that. I think I downloaded that too, and I. I've never actually tried it. I, I kind of want to try it. it. But Altium seems to be a pretty good fit for what I'm doing. You, know, you can do multi layer BGAs, um, blind and buried vias, all that stuff. You know what those are? Yeah. Yeah, we have vias between layers, but they don't go all the way through the board. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, they probably all do that. <laughs> what? All that stuff you just said. All the different programs probably do all that stuff, No, they right? don't. Really? Mm -mm. I don't know if KiCad and Eagle even handle that. Blind and buried vias. I don't know. I know I've never done a design with it. So I've I never. I didn't ever either. It's too damned expensive. Yeah. That's why, you know, the six layer board is the uh, most complicated board I've designed yet, and that was pretty expensive. You know, that's probably, I paid 60 bucks a board, so. But this is prototype, you know, if I had went in production, it'd be a lot cheaper than that. Sure. Most of that was just setup charges, you know, the NREs, non recurring engineering fees. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you, know you gotta, you know, plot all of that stuff, you know, make films, and then you use it, and, you know, that's it, so. If I had a hundred boards made, it probably would have you know, been five or six or seven dollars a board. Yeah, I got out all my boards. I was going to take a picture of all the circuit boards I've designed. I have a box of them. You know, I try to keep a copy of every board I ever made, too. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I've got a tenth. Oh really? What I've actually had come through here. I have just about every board I've made. I think. Really? Mm-hmm. I have at least one extra. Just about every board. Hmm. You know, at work. I probably designed seventy or eighty boards. Home, probably thirty or forty at least. So in these days, hell, I've been designing even more than before because it's so cheap and easy now with Altium. You know, God, it's so easy. Yeah. You just whip out that you know that M eighty two board. I think I spent an hour and a half making that. Right. And that was it. Right. So, and most of that time was sourcing. I think I downloaded the PIC footprint, and then I generated that 40 pin um, dip outline, and then I had the other parts. And then I just hooked them up on the schematic, hooked them up on the board, and that was it. Yeah, easy peasy. So, 
Didn't you have some of those RGB adapters that didn't work or were damaged or something? I kind of remember that. Yeah, the one that you were handling. Oh, this one? Was that the one that was in the video? This is the one with the scratch. Yes. Yes. And I don't, I don't know that the scratch is the reason it don't work. I don't know that. It did reprogram it and it didn't do anything. But the other one that doesn't work, this is some kind of uh, power failure on the NES, we think. Everything that was connected to 5 volts, blue. Mm -hmm. Well, I blew up a Nintendo once, doing the copy nest mod. Yeah. Well, I I was doing I wasn't doing the mod. I well I did, but I was testing it, and the power switch for the front loader, you know, it's on the wire. It was just flopping around. I'm flipping the board over, and then it touched the bottom of the circuit board, and I lost PPU, CPU, EEPROM on the copy nest board, port chip, and then those two seven four three sixty eight for the controllers. <laughs> that sucks. Because yeah, that's unregulated. Uh, what? 14, 12, 14, 14, 14 volts, volts yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I knew it was on there, but I thought I was being careful, and one slip, and poof, pops all your chips. Very unforgiving. Yeah, that's not the first time I've done that. I've done that a couple times. After that, I got much smarter, so, you know. It's pretty rare when I actually blow something up now. I mean, it happens. I can't remember the last time it happened, though. Because I always test, you know, three or four times, you know, it seems silly, but you never know. Mm -hmm. you know you, I always check if I'm going to hook something up, like a circuit board, you know, I always check ground on the chips, you know, on a connector, just to make sure I have it. Because you never know. You know, it's like, oh crap, I hooked, the, hooked that up to the power supply backwards. Oh, well, that's not good. Good thing I tested it. Right. <laughs> Did you do the breakaways or did they do that? Mouse they bites. Did. They did it. Mouse bites. That's what they call those. Really? Mm -hmm. They kind of look like a mouse bite, I guess. I didn't. I just learned that the other day. That's what that was called. Did they come pre-broken out? Uh, it depends. Did they on how they panelize it? Mm -hmm. Well, like right there, there's. That's what they sent me. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're panelized. Medium run order. Three, four, five, twenty up. So you got. Twelve. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So yeah, two hundred forty boards. Which it was. I. Eh, I think it's only supposed to be ten. For the medium run, but. They like. They do overage. Yeah. Just in exactly. case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I was only supposed to get ten of those those six layer boards, but I got eleven because mm -hmm. they do they do uh. So apparently one of them failed. Yeah, they usually do a twenty percent overrun. So yeah, if you order ten boards, they usually make like twelve. <coughs> yeah, those LED Game Boy boards. They only sent me ten, and one of them had been manually fixed. Oh really? So you know they must have had little problems with those. So that's they a four-layer board. They didn't board. do an overage, apparently. Yeah, well, they did, but they probably were all both bad. So they had like oh, three bad boards, and they fixed one. Mm -hmm. So I ended up stuffing the one that they had fixed. I didn't actually see that. I probably wouldn't have used it, but hey, it works, so I can't complain. Yeah, that was a really fun board to design. I had a lot of fun doing that. Four layers on that one, of course. That board, um, there's only one plate on that. Three of them are trace layers on that board. Because I needed all the routing I could get. All those LEDs. I like to see that in action sometimes. Yeah, you can see that. I got it hooked up to a pick right now. Just It turns them all on. Um, I haven't actually multi... I, there, I mean, it's all multiplex and it's working properly, but I haven't really put any data on it. Because I've been waiting until I get that damn six layer board done to drive it. So that's why that's why it hasn't you know done much with it, but it's all ready to go. I mean, if I had that hooked up to an FPGA, I'd be playing Game Boy on it in no time. You know, actually to get it to work probably wouldn't take me more than a day or two. But yeah, 
Yeah, that's a bastard system right there, the Game Boy. <laughs> took seems like everybody had one now. Yeah. Oh, I love the system. I mean the hardware. Oh, I see. It took three tries before I actually got it to work all the way. That's how bad the video hardware is on that. Really? Because it's an LCD. It's not a CRT. So what they do, they actually stop sending video to the LCD to grab the sprites. Really? They stop sending video. Hmm. Grab the sprite data and then continue sending the video. And you know to do the the, the smooth scrolling on the on the x axis, what they do, they send all the pixels out and then they just neglect to clock them into the display. So they miss pixels. By doing that, it causes all the graphics to shift over a pixel every time they miss one. Hmm. Isn't that nasty? <laughs> so find x scroll, you know, because it's got characters like the NES. It's got you know eight by eight characters. So they have to do that, so they'll skip between 0 and 7 clocks, and that causes the pixel to shift 0 to 7 times to the left, and that's how they do the scrolling. Weird. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it is really weird. It's really neat to see it like on a scope when you're scrolling the screen, because you can watch the data go on the display, because it's just like, burr, 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 as, it, as the scrolling happens. It's really pretty cool. <laughs> but the bastard about it is the timing, and a lot of some games require you to have cycle accurate timing on that video or else the game doesn't work right. You like corrupted graphics. And that's why it was so hard is because you have to emulate that exact timing to make it work. Some games they require like one cycle accuracy or better to make it actually function. Sucks. So that's why it took so long for Game Boy. You know, you think, oh, that's not hard. Well, shouldn't you, be. It, it shouldn't, shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, whoever designed that hardware was on crack or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's very elegant, but just figuring out it's how. It's probably an elegant solution to a, it a oh, bad it supply problem, or you know, you know, well, you can only use this screen or these chips, so make it work. Well, there's only one chip. Yeah. It's an ASIC. Um, here's what. I'll show you what I made to actually debug this. So I made this um I made a perf board video uh Game Boy. It's a Game Boy on perf board hooked into my logic analyzer. So this is how we this is how I do my heavy duty reverse engineering. So this is the length I go to make sure my video game emulations on the FPGA are accurate. I actually go to this length and hook in this logic analyzer to do that. So I thought I had a I had a picture of the um Oh yeah, that was me rendering the Game Boy video um, from a real Game Boy out the FPGA. That's not the picture I want. I don't know what I did with that. So this is what the logic analyzer shows me. So you, um, you can see the video graphics address, the program address, and then the data and what the, all the signals are doing. So that's how I figured out how it was working. So that's what all those wires are hooking up. I had a picture of that somewhere. Yeah, and this is on the FPGA. Um, what I had done, because this was such a difficult problem, I hooked that real Game Boy into my FPGA board and ran my fake Game Boy in lockstep with the real Game Boy and compared the signals between my Game Boy and the real one as it ran the same program. And there's a result. So this is the real Game Boy up here, and this is the fake one, and you see the signals all perfectly line up. So that's what I that's how I had to do that. That's how hard this was. So I kinda wish I had footage of me doing that, but eh, it took long enough as it was. Like I said, it took me three iterations to get the damn Game Boy to actually work. So, but yeah, the signal tap's really cool because what it is, it's like a logic analyzer built into the FPGA out of the FPGA, um, you know, itself. 
And so you can debug your own design. You can debug the FPGA using the FPGA. <laughs> all right. And it's really pretty cool because, I mean, it's not really complicated. What it does, it shows you what all those signals are doing in time. You know, time goes this way, and those are just high and low signals. So, I mean, it's really easy to debug this way. So, see, if, it, if things got really serious and I wanted to figure out how something was working, I can hook that logic analyzer up and get this type of information. It's kind of like an oscilloscope times like 100, but it's only for digital. You can only tell high and low. You can't tell voltage range. So it's like an oscilloscope for digital stuff, yeah. basically. So yeah, I was just, I got really obnoxious and like made this really huge um, thing to debug it, the signal tap instance. I pretty much used up all of the resources on the chip just doing this, but it's what I had to do, so what can you do? That. Yeah, that's how those LEDs came. That sucked. They came in packs of 10 from China. And I had to like unwrap all of those damn displays. That, God, it took me like three or four hours to do that. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. And that one had a bad LED on it. I don't know, did you see these? I can't remember I showed these to you. I don't think so. Yeah, I had some problems with them being... The brightness wasn't quite accurate, so I, um... Because the... I had, like, voltage drop on the routes, because there's so many LEDs, so I had to, like, bump the voltage up a little bit to make them all uniform. Huh. So the other problem I have is you can see they're not all quite uniform still. So what I was going to do, I was going to take a, uh, a camera, put it on a tripod, and take a picture of this. And then get the brightness of each LED out of the picture and then calibrate it out. Oh my. Yeah, change the brightness of each LED to calibrate out the differences. So I thought that'd be really fun. Fun is not the word I was thinking. <laughs> well, it's better than like trying to measure each one of those LEDs individually. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah. I mean, electronics is fun. I'm pretty much limited by my tools and money. You know, if I had more money and more tools, I could probably do a lot better stuff. I kind of want to get into well, shit. And, and, and we live in the age. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. I, I totally wish I was like 15 right I now. know, me too. Because now is the time to be into this kind of stuff. Yeah, my first... Soak it all in and... The first 16 oh, or 17 years of my life, you know, with no internet... In just some magazines, it's very hard to learn electronics. You know, you had to basically, you're at mercy of the people writing these magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, hoping they're going to cover something you find interesting and then being able to cover it all the way. And the thing that always would piss me off about the magazine, they're like, oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is beyond the scope of this article. If you want more information, consult your local technical library. <laughs> Who the fuck had a technical library? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll just go down the street. Oh, wh <laughs> what? That's a gravel road down there? I don't think there's a technical library down the street. Oh, God, that would always... Oh, that just make me irate. Cause, you know, they're talking about something really cool. They're like, oh, you want more information? Consult your local technical library or um, uh, college library. I'm like, I live in a small town. I live out... I live five miles from a small town. You know, when I was a kid, I was in the country bumpkin. So, yeah. no, no, nothing out there other than some houses now and again. You know, no... No, um, no libraries, no, not colleges. even, no colleges, no schools, no nothing. So yeah, that was always annoying. And then, you know, they'd always, you know, if they covered something that was interesting, you know, there'd only be so much they could put in an in a article, right? And then you had to wait till next month, you know, for the conclusion. You know, radio electronics, the thing that I was made that they made this build the RE robot. You know, it's like this robot thing. It looked like a forklift with wheels. Yeah. And it was a, their robot, the radio electronics robot. And it was like 11 parts. Wow. 11 parts, almost a whole year just to get the entire, like, plans to build the thing. <laughs> and nowadays it would be a half a page article and then there would be a link to the rest of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is great. Yeah, oh, I but, love it. Yeah, you know, that's, a, yeah, use the internet if you want to learn how to do anything. It's awesome, you know, like on this 
FPGA stuff, yeah, I've been learning as I've gone along. Like, you know, I had a problem with the audio sounding like crap because, you know, the NES generates the audio. It doesn't have a sample rate. You know, it doesn't have a fixed sample rate. It just has counters and things. And when they count, you know, they produce a square wave, right? So, well, how do you, can, how do you sample that and send it out to, like, an audio DAC? Well, if you just sample it and send it out, it's going to sound horrible because it's going to alias. You know, there's things in there that are higher frequency than what the um, sample rate allows. So what ends up happening is it sounds really horrible. Mm. you got to get those out of there. So I, I looked up how to do filtering and spent probably a week learning on how to do that. Mm. And then I got it out of there. So, but yeah. Lots of fun. Time machine, man. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, first time I used a computer, I think I was in third grade, fourth grade. My dad brought home a TRS-80 Model 3 Radio Shack computer. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and that was the best thing ever. My dad brought home on, um, you know, for the Christmas holidays, so it was around for a week or two, and you know, my sister and I got to play on it whenever we wanted. So that was like the first time I ever actually used a computer. I don't think I can remember my first time. It had to have been an Apple at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be Probably the second time I used yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had, um, in an elementary school, they had like two Apple II computers, and they were on one of those wheelie carts, and they wheel it into the classroom. I remember in like third grade, um, the guy wheeling it in the classroom and like listing just a basic program, and they you were know, just scrolling on the screen, and everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, junior high, we had Apple IIs. Well, we had Commodore 64s, and then the next year they got rid of them all and went to Apple IIs. Hmm. Now, I had a Commodore at home at this point, so, you right. know, I was playing lots of games. My friend, of course, had all these pirated games, so I got a bunch of discs and copied discs. And I was playing games, programming, you know, get the magazines, the whole nine yards, so. I still haven't figured out what computer we had. We had one. And it looks just like every other Commodore 64, or, you know, the all built in. But I swear it had a game cartridge port on the side, and I swear I had Predator on it. Hmm. But I also remember, you know, the I we programmed in a like a paint shop program into uh -huh. it from the book, you know, just copying it in there. And I have yet to figure out what console that thing actually <laughs> was. Not console, but computer. Just, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. I can't figure it out, you know, and we, of course we, there's no pictures of it from whenever yeah, we got yeah. it or whenever. Don't even remember who gave it to us or anything, and it's well, been it's, driving me nuts forever. Well, have you, have you looked? There's really not that many. Well, of... and I looked for Predator, because I'm pretty sure oh, it yeah. was called Predator. Uh -huh. you know, I can remember playing was it. Was it a TI-99 4A? I don't think so. I think it was white. White. And it was just mostly keyboard. It's a um, Radio Shack... Color computer, I bet. Is that what it's called? Color computer? Yes. Radio Shack color computer, if I had to guess. Because those were right, white. Uh, like a color computer two or three. Yeah, like oh this. Boy. When you say white, that is the only computer. See, there's a cartridge port on the side. Holy shit, that sticker looks like it. That's that's the only white home computer with a cartridge port on the side I know of. Some bitch. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, there's a couple different models. So is this just like a different version of the TRC? No, it was totally different. The only thing that was the same was the name, which is kind of confusing. So yeah, this was well the TRS model, uh, you know TRS eighty was the one was the was the one that looks kind of like a I've got space, one of those. the the big gray thing with the built-in monitor. Oh no, I was thinking more like that. Oh, like that one. Radio Shack. Yeah, it was the model three. It looks like something out of Star Trek, kind of. <laughs> with the big floppy drives on it. That's the what's the first computer I ever used. Really? It's all built into one unit. Had the two floppies. I don't know, this one doesn't have the floppies, it just has the the little fake slots there. Yeah, they don't look like drives at all. <laughs> no, they're not. What? 
the hell? Oh, it's like a You're prime. visiting the page that the picture is hosted on. Yeah. I've noticed that's been happening somewhat. Or I've been... I thought I clicked view image. Oh, I clicked the image. That's what happened. Yep, that's it. It was a uh, white, black and white. Yeah, there's the, what the drives in it. But yeah, that's just the fake drives. So yeah, the yeah, I'm pretty sure the one you're thinking of is the color computer. They had like two or three different models of it. And one of them is white with the cart port on the side. So yeah, and that might make sense because my stepdad was probably the original owner of it. Because I don't remember it being a gift or anything like that. Uh huh. Yeah, this one. And he couldn't remember it at all either. <laughs> He has a good story about programming. He programmed his own accounting software somehow or other to do taxes, maybe. No, you don't have a you don't have the um, thingy on that keyboard. I just noticed that. Yeah, the keyboard kind of sucks. The the little insert delete keys. Mm -hmm. They're there. You just have to push your function button. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. They're a part of the number key. Right. Let's see if there's a list of um, cartridges. Oh yeah, ink cartridges. Yeah. That, that really works on a computer, doesn't it? Fucking out of Coke. Are you sure it's not pro protectors? Or prospector? Is there a Terminator? Might be. I found the list of games. Nope, no Terminator. Hmm. There's more games than I suspected. I didn't think there was that many games. Is there an emulator for it? I'm sure there is. It's called the Coco, by the way. C-O-C-O. -C -O. That's the nickname for it. Because, you know, color computer, C-O-C-O. -C -O. Right. So, yeah, I forgot about that, too. I, I knew some one person that had one. I didn't really know very many people that had them. Most people I knew had a Commodore or an Apple, too. Yeah. And this was, you know... Pre-internet. Well, no, yes, but it was. I would say it was after better computers were available than mm. I had. It. Oh, okay. Like, I'm pretty sure we already had the Amiga at that uh -huh. point, too. And yeah, I, I had an Amiga 500, around. yeah. I had a Commodore... I ours was a 500. Oh, yeah? I still have that damn thing. It's in the closet at home. And we still got ours. Of course, <laughs> it wasn't mine. It was... Yeah. Uh, my parents had a video production company with oh, yeah? videotaping weddings and stuff. And they were using that... To do the video... To do some of this, you the know, titles or something. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Did they have a video toaster? Yeah. First. They did? At first. I don't think they I think they quit using it. Or no. That's part of the Amiga, isn't it? No, it's an it was a it was like the big hot video editing a plug in board for the Amiga. Yes. It was like duh shit. Yes. I remember I sent away for a promotional VHS tape for the video toaster. It was like awesome. <laughs> I still have I wanna digitize that tape, but someone's already done it. Oh. Yeah, I found you can see it on um, YouTube. But they were doing like 3D animations with it and stuff. So I was like, the tits. Mm -hmm. You know, back in 87, 88, 89. It would have been, let's see, I think we moved to Showville the summer of 90. So it would have been after that. Uh huh. And they had the standalone system before that. I don't remember what it was called, but it could do green screen stuff. I remember uh -huh. that. That was a big fuckeroo. They wasted all of their free time playing doing with it. no, just oh, doing, just videos doing it. or you know, as a business. Yes, uh huh. Mm -hmm. And you know, made no money. <laughs> of course, they probably spent a lot of the, their profits on getting newer, better equipment. You know, now that's always what happens. Yeah. The whole spend money to make money, and then you spend money, and then you don't make enough money. So mm -hmm. right. Well, I had a friend that. Um, so when they knew their parents were in that too, they were, you know, wedding photography, but they were just doing photography. And actually, you know, they made millions of dollars doing this. They had, they made so much freaking money that they actually bought their own, like, chemical photo processing machine oh, to do the prints. And then 
you know, this was not even that long ago. Then, you know, of course, digital cameras came in and ate their lunch, and they got, you know, they, they had, like, they bought, like, this, like, two or three million dollar mansion. And since the bottom, like, fell out of their market, you know, like, overnight, you know, they had, like, this mansion they can't get rid of, and, you know, they're running out of money. You know, that was a couple years ago, so I don't know what happened now, but... Oh, my. Doesn't that suck? That would so suck. Of course, I wouldn't buy a three million dollar mansion unless I could just pay for it. Yes, I know I wouldn't either. I mean, that money from—I mean, you should have been seeing the writing on the wall, you know, digital camera. Yeah, that was fifteen wet years photography, ago. Wet photography, digital camera, wet photography. <laughs> yeah, that processor. It's like, who the hell's gonna buy that? The white elephant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see.